So, Assalamu alaikum, guys. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Nalevi. I'm a third year medical student. Uh, I apologize. I'm a bit sick right now, so I'm going to be coughing and blowing my nose during the lecture, but inshallah, that won't mess up the learning. Um, again, if you guys have any questions or anything, feel free to interrupt me. Feel free to type it in chat. I'll try to address everything. I'm staying here until everyone understands everything. Uh, this concept or this lecture is a lot simpler than the previous one, uh, inshallah, so we'll be able to finish it a lot quicker. So first and foremost, we're going to begin with our first e equation, and there's not that many in this lecture, but we're going to be introducing the idea of compliance. So what is compliance exactly? Compliance is essentially just how much can a vessel hold? Uh, how much can a vessel hold, right? So there is an equation for compliance, which is the change in volume over the change in pressure, right? So what that essentially means is that there's two things here. There's the pressure, which is the- um, I have questions, sorry. sorry. The question, you said compliance is how much the vessels can hold blood or the nutrients, you mean? Uh, blood. Blood. Okay. It's how much, you know, how can the vessels accommodate for the change in volume under change in pressure, essentially. So again, we have this equation here to calculate compliance. So it's again, change in volume over the change in pressure. And like we know in normal fractions, the lower the number and the denominator, so the lower the pressure, the greater the compliance is going to be. And the same is uh, the same is applicable, vice versa for the numerator. So what determines compliance? Besides volume and pressure, there are two things that go into creating compliance in the vessel. So there's something called static compliance, and then there's something called dynamic compliance. So static compliance is what naturally exists uh, in humans. So we have these things called elastin and collagen, which you guys you guys are aware of what that is from foundation. Um, and those are present in our vessels in different amounts. and the amounts those that are present in our vessels change with things like our age and with disease as well. So with those variables, we can have a change in compliance as well. The other thing is dynamic compliance. And now dynamic compliance is something that's going to be changing a lot more frequently than static compliance because we have, uh, we have the nervous system in our body that's responsible or part of its responsibility is changing the dynamic compliance. And the way it's going to be doing this is by changing the tone of the vessels. And what that essentially means is making either diameter wider through vasodilation or more narrow through vasoconstriction. So does everyone understand what static and dynamic compliance is? <laughs> yes, okay, great. So moving on to the next slide. So here is a graph that kind of explains things better. So Momo mentioned previously that veins can hold a large amount of blood. And this is a concept I'm gonna be introducing throughout this lecture that veins act as our reservoir for blood in the body. And we're gonna explain what that means in a bit. But veins have very high compliance. And the reason for this is because veins, uh, can hold more volume without a big increase in the pressure. However, with something like arteries, they need to have be able to move that blood quickly. They're not. You don't want to hold the blood in the arteries. You want the blood in the arteries to be going to the location that it needs to go. So you don't want the arteries to be very compliant because they need to deliver that blood somewhere. The veins already, you know, the blood was already delivered. The oxygen is gone. They don't need to go somewhere as drastically as they would with the arteries. So looking at this graph here, we can see that veins can carry a high amount of volume, right? And the pressure won't increase as drastically as it would with an artery. So see how here, as the volume is increasing minimally uh, with the arteries, the pressure is increasing greatly. However, when the same thing is being applied to veins, we're getting a huge increase in volume, but the pressure is not changing that much, right? So that's going back to our equation of change in volume over change in pressure. It's the same idea with fractions here. Now, something to take note of here that the doctor mentioned in his, in his slides is that the compliance of veins is going to decrease at high pressures. And you can see that again on the graph here. When we're reaching a higher pressure, the veins are not able to hold as much volume as they were originally able to in the beginning. All right. However, in the case of arteries, they're always going to be low compliance throughout the entire part of the graph. Now, as you get, of course, as you get to a higher pressure or sorry, a higher volume, they're going to be able to hold, they'll be less compliant. But throughout everything, the arteries are going to be less compliant. The veins are going to be more compliant. That's your main concept. Is that clear? All right, great. 
Moving on, this is just a diagram to sort of help you guys imagine exactly what's going on. So an artery is being <laughs> sorry, an artery is being represented here by a balloon, right? So a balloon is not a very compliant structure. All right, you can blow a balloon up to a certain extent before it gets way too tense and it pops, right? So an artery is going to be like that. Plus artery, uh, yeah. Plus a balloon is you know when you're not tying it up or anything, it's going to eject everything right away. Same same idea with arteries. However, a vein is a much more compliant structure. So take into account this bag, right? If you're filling a plastic bag with a liquid, it's not going to go anywhere. It's going to, you know, wrap around the liquid and be able to hold it a lot better. And it could hold way more liquid than a balloon would be able to, for example, because the balloon will pop relatively quickly, right? So veins have much more elastic walls and they have less recoil than arteries. So they're able to become a lot more compliant than arteries would. Do we understand that? Yes, okay, great. We're going very quickly. All right, so changes in compliance. There's a couple of things that can cause changes in compliance. So again, we already discussed what goes into creating compliance. We said it was the dynamic compliance and the static compliance. So a change in compliance can be due to constriction. So we have our uh, sympathetic nervous system that can cause vasoconstriction, which is just taking the vessel from this circle shape to a smaller one, all right? So look at this graph here for an example of that. Here we have a vein, right? That is not constricted. And now this is the same uh, graph that we had previously where this axis is volume and this axis is pressure, right? So see how when the vein is relaxed, it's not, you know, it's very compliant, but as you constrict the vein, it becomes a lot less compliant. So this is the, this is the concept of dy or constriction, dynamic compliance being applied here. They're also mentioning aged here, which is the static compliant. As we age, our vessels uh, get not as good as they are when we're younger, right? That was a very unmedical way to say that, but the idea is put across. <laughs> so with age, we have static compliance. This is something that happens naturally, um, and your vessels will not become will not be as compliant as they previously were. Now, arterial disease is something that doesn't happen naturally, but it does happen to many people, and that's another example of static compliance. Now, again, to remind you guys what static compliance is, it's the presence of elastin and collagen in the vessel. So with arterial disease, you're going to have decreased amounts of that, which is going to lead to a less compliant vessel. So again, this concept again, age increases vessel stiffness, which leads to decreased compliance. Now, the key concept here, right, is that stiffness is the exact opposite of compliance. So can someone remind me what the equation for compliance was? Volume over pressure? Yeah, perfect. It's change in volume over change in pressure. Now, taking what I just said about stiffness being the exact opposite of compliance, what do you think the equation for stiffness is? Pressure over volume. Exactly. So <clears throat> that's your next equation that you're going to have to learn. Stiffness is pressure over volume. If a vessel is not compliant, it's stiff, vice versa. These things are opposites of each other. So that's all you need to know from this slide. Are we all clear with that? Is everyone ever, does everyone understand how we got to stiffness as well? <laughs> I can't tell if these yeses are from my last slide or from this slide. No, I hear you. Someone sent another yes. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah. uh, moving on to the next slide. Oh, here was the reveal of the equation for you guys, but you guys got it. Stiffness, like I said, is change in pressure over change in volume. Uh, moving on. So capacitance vessels, which is a very fancy phrase for veins, uh, basically what this concept is, is that veins, like I previously mentioned, act as a reservoir for blood. So just keep in the back of your mind that veins are the most compliant vessels that we have in our body. So veins act as a reservoir for blood due to their high compliance. Okay, so why is this important, right? Our veins are responsible for controlling venous return and cardiac output. Now, we all know what that means, right? We all understand venous return and cardiac output, correct? Okay, great. Um, so how do our veins influence venous return and cardiac output? So back to, again, to our sympathetic nervous system, when we need to increase the venous return and thus increase the cardiac output, we have a system in our body that's gonna say, hey, we need these veins to constrict 
right? Because we need to get the blood that's pooling in our legs due to gravity back up to the center of our body so that we can get the blood moving again. So how does this happen? This diagram is a very easy way to understand it. So first and foremost, we're going to get that signal from our sympathetic nervous system, which is going to increase the sympathetic activity to the smooth muscles that's around the veins, right? Now, when that sympathetic activity stimulates those smooth muscles, smooth muscles, they're going to contract and increase the tone of the veins, which is going to make them, you know, smaller, right? This increased tone, like we mentioned before, is going to decrease the compliance of these veins. That means the veins are going to say, hey, we're done holding this blood now, get it away from us. So that blood is going to be displaced and move up back towards the heart. And it's going to be delivered all the way back to the right atrium. Yeah. <laughs> that way we're increasing venous return and cardiac output. All right. And then this graph is just here again. Oops. This graph is just here again to remind you guys about how veins are a lot more compliant. So does everyone understand why veins wouldn't that increase blood flow? Yeah, it is increasing blood flow. The blood is flowing that was reserved in our blood. Uh, it was that was reserved in our veins, you know, that is going back to our heart so that we can pump it and get oxygen to other places in our body. So does everyone understand how veins act as a reservoir for blood? This concept is important. So if you guys don't get it, like I don't mind repeating it a couple of times. Is there, no. Are we all good with this so I move on? If not, let me know now. Okay, all good, all right. Again, any questions, feel free to stop me. Oops, oops. No, this is an old slide. All right, so central venous pressure, right? That's the next slide. Central venous pressure. So what is central venous pressure? It's exactly what the name says. It's, I'll show you the picture first. It's essentially the pressure in this area, right? The vena cava. And it's just an important uh, measurement to know because it determines a lot of things in the body. So going back to central venous pressure, it is the pressure in the thoracic vena cava right near the right atrium. And this, what is this representing? It's representing the average blood pressure that's present in the veins, right? So, you know, think that thinking this through, what can cause changes in central venous pressure? It can either be due to changes in the volume of blood within the veins, or it can be due to changes in compliance of these veins, right? So we said if there's less compliance, then we're going to be sending more blood up. And if there's increased volume, obviously there's going to be more blood. So this is the next equation that you guys should know is that central venous pressure is equal to the change in volume over the compliance of the veins, right? And again, you can see this graph here sort of explaining the same idea that we talked about a few times, where if we're increasing the tone, <laughs> if we're increasing the tone, there's going to be less volume in the blood, right? And there's going to be an increased amount of pressure. So we're seeing this point here, we increase the tone, we're constricting that blood and we're moving it here. So is that concept clear? Yes, oh, I closed the chat, whoops. Okay, great, I'm moving on. Uh, so this picture is just, again, a visual diagram for what central venous pressure is exactly. Uh, this catheter and stuff is not like for you guys to know, this is just the image that I found, but this is essentially the tool that they use to measure central venous pressure. Uh, but just the important thing from this slide is to know that this thing here is central venous pressure. Right. So, Ibrahim, what affects central venous pressure? Many things. Let's discuss them one by one. All right. First and foremost, we're going to discuss the things that will increase central venous pressure. All right. So think about it. If we have a decrease in cardiac output, okay, for example, in left ventricular heart failure, what's going to happen if we have a decrease in cardiac output? If there is less cardiac output, 
blood is not flowing in the way that it should be flowing, right? And if that's happening, that means blood is going to start backing up and pooling because it's not going anywhere. The heart is not pumping in the way that it should be pumping, which means that the blood is going to start backflowing and pooling, which is going to lead to it entering the venous circulation and staying there and not going anywhere. And if it's staying there and not going anywhere, we're going to be increasing the central venous pressure because we're going to have an increased volume in the venous system. So do we understand that first point? Okay, so that first point is exactly the second point, except it's not because of a decrease in cardiac output. If you have, for any reason, can you repeat it again? Yes. So if we're having a decrease in cardiac output, right, what's happening is that our heart pump is not functioning in the way that it should be fun functioning, right? So what occurs is that the blood is not going to be circulating in the body the way it should, and it's going to start backing up into the veins. And if it's backing up into the veins, it's not going back to the heart to go back in the arteries. So it's staying in the veins. If it's staying in the veins, technically there isn't an increase of volume, but there's more volume of the blood inside the vein area, right? Which is going to lead to an increase in the venous pressure there. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, okay, great. So the next point is pretty much the same idea, except for whatever reason, there can be an increase in the volume of blood in our body. If there's an increase of volume of blood in our body, again, our veins are the reservoir for all the blood. They carry a lot of it. So that's going to increase central venous pressure. That one is clear, yeah? Great. So venous constriction. Um, would that increase cardiac output? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, doesn't have to, but it, it may, it may not. However, just know that an increase of volume, a lot of it is going to pool inside the veins. And if it's pooling inside the veins, that means there's going to be increased central venous pressure. All right. So moving on to venous constriction, we said that if the veins constrict, right? And guys, one thing that I want you to understand, and this is going to help us for the next two points, is that Gravity plays a role in where the blood is in our body, right? So we are standing up for a majority of our time that we are awake. And in that, the blood in our veins is going to be pooling in our legs, right? So a lot of the blood that we have, the reservoir, is actually in our legs, right? That's where they're staying. So when we increase venous constriction, right, we're constricting that smooth muscle around the veins in our legs. And that's sending the blood right back up to where our heart is, okay? So when we have venous constriction, right? We're going to have an increase in central venous pressure because we're sending that blood straight back up. Does that make sense? I don't think it makes sense. I'm not getting, okay. Yes, it does. Now, changing from standing to supine, actually, let me make sure. Okay. So changing from standing to supine, the best example I can give you guys is looking at a water bottle. So this is our blood when we're standing. It's pooling in our legs, right? So the central venous, pretend the empty part is where our heart is, right? This is the central venous pressure. It's not very high right now. Now, supine means you're laying down, which means, look, where did the blood go? The blood went back up to our hearts. Is that clear? This one is the one I struggle most to understand, by the way. So it's okay if you guys didn't understand it. Okay, no, you guys got it, mashallah. Um, now, <clears throat> arteriolar dilation. Now let's, let's get it. So standing up decreases venous return. Yes, standing up can decrease venous return because when we stand up, again, gravity is playing a role in sending that blood back down to our legs. But again, there are, there is, a lot of mechanisms in our body to make sure that the change that happens when we're standing up is not drastic. And you guys are going to take this in other lectures. Uh, there's something called orthostatic hypotension. I'm not going to get into it now because uh, I'm not sure if you take it in CVP. Maybe you do, but it's going to come up later. And there are mechanisms in our body to prevent huge changes from happening when we change our position so that we don't faint. All right. But moving on to the next point, oops, uh, arteriolar dilation. <laughs> Uh, so when we have dilation of our arterioles, right, our arterioles are carrying that blood from the arteries, we're going to have an increased flow of blood, right? Now, arterioles, where are they going? Based on Momo's lectures, they're going arterioles. I could draw. We're going from the arterioles to the capillaries, right? And then from the capillaries back to the veins, okay? 
Now, if we're increasing the flow of blood, uh, or if we're increasing the size of the arterioles, more blood is flowing, right? So that means more blood is going through the capillaries. That means way more blood is getting to the venules, right, in the veins. So we're increasing the amount of blood that is in the venous system, okay? That means we're going to have increase in central venous pressure. It's kind of the same concept as the first two points. Does that make sense? <laughs> kind of. Okay, wait. How? Okay, what part of it did you not get? So I can explain it better. All right, I'll just, I'll start, how is it similar to the first two points? So what's happening in the first two points, okay, maybe not so much the second point, but in the first point, what's happening is that we're having a displacement of the volume. More of the volume is in the venous system. So the same thing is going on here. More of the volume, because we're dilating the arterioles, there's more blood entering the venous system, right? If there's more blood entering the venous system, that means there's an increased volume. Now, there's not actually a change in the volume. It's just more of it is there than it is in the arteries. And if more of the volume is in the veins than it is in the arteries, we're going to increase the central venous pressure. Does, does that clarify what I meant? Yeah, so both end up with more in the venous system. Exactly. It's just in different ways, more blood is ending up in the venous system. And if there's more blood in the venous system, one cause... One cause of arterial, exactly. One cause of arteriolar dilation. So when you're having arteriolar dilation, more blood is flowing to the venous system. When you're having decreased cardiac output, more blood is backing up into the venous system. Does that make sense? Okay, great. So the last point is what I was kind of talking about, about gravity, right? So you're welcome. So muscle contractions of the limbs and the abdomen will compress veins. So you guys know the structure of veins by now, but they have these uh, one-way valves, right? So when a vein is, oops, when a vein is contracted, right, it's going to push blood through these valves up. And then because there are these valves, the blood is not going to fall back down. So when we have muscle contraction of our limbs, like for example, in our legs or in our abdomen or even in our arms, right? that's going to have an effect on the vessels because what are our vessels surrounded by? Every other structure in our body, right? So when we have, when we have these muscle contractions, we're gonna squeeze these veins, which is gonna push the blood, right? And it's gonna send it back towards the heart. Do we understand why muscle contractions increase central venous pressure now? Is it like the sartorius in the leg? That is an example, yeah. It can be any muscle and anywhere in the body will cause contraction because all our muscles contract in one way or another. So they're going to cause contraction around the veins and they're going to send the blood. Cool? Okay, great. So guys, don't try to memorize this because you might confuse yourself. This is all about understanding, right? This section of the lecture is a lot more about understanding than it is equations. So think your way through each one. You may get a question saying something like, if this were to happen, what would happen to central venous pressure? For example, if they say, oh, a patient comes in and their cardiac output was calculated and it was decreased, what is to be expected of the central venous pressure? Think your way through that so that you can reach the conclusion that it will be increased. All right. Now for decreased central venous pressure, the only thing that was mentioned in your lecture is that arterial constriction is going to reduce the volume of blood in the venous system. So this is exactly the opposite of this point, right? Here we said dilation is going to cause more blood to flow to the venous system. Here, constriction, you know, we're making the arterioles way smaller, less blood is flowing. That means less blood is going through the capillaries into the veins. If less blood is going to the capillaries in the veins, there's going to be less volume in the venous system. That means there's going to be a decrease in the central venous pressure. All clear? Yes, awesome. So moving on to the next point. Um, this is something called the Windkessel effect, all right? Uh, I'm not sure if you have to know the name, but I'd recommend just knowing it anyways. So what is the Windkessel effect? The Windkessel effect is just the special thing that our, uh, that our aorta does, right? To ensure that blood is moving during the cycle, the cardiac cycle. 
So we have ventricular diastole, which is when our ventricles are relaxing. So during systole, right, which is when our heart is contracting, and look at this image here right now. During systole, our aorta is actually distended. So see how the aorta is kind of getting wider here? So the reason that this is happening is because we want to get as much blood out of the ventricle as possible to the rest of the body, because we need to supply every organ and everything in our body with oxygen, right? So that's why during systole, during contraction, we're going to sort of expand the aorta so more blood gets through, right? And then during diastole, which is when the ventricle, ventricle is relaxing, the aorta is actually going to recoil. So it's going to get, you know, go from out to in. It's going to get smaller. And this is to make sure that any of the blood that's sort of left over there after contraction is being pushed, right? Because there's no point in the blood staying in the aorta, right? we need to get it everywhere else in the body. So they want to have it recoil during diastole so that we can send all the blood to the rest of the body. And this is just going to help maintain coronary blood flow, which is what I already mentioned. So do we understand what the Windkessel effect is? Is this dichrotic notch? What? Well, what's the... Is, the is, this di is, the, is the dichrotic notch? I don't understand your question. In the Wiggler's diagram. Is it to do with aorta? Oh, um, uh, yeah. I don't remember who which pal session it was, but there was a dichrotic notch in the, the Wiggler's diagram notch. that represents the Winkessel effect about how the blood is going back in the aorta, like it's pushing back through oh, the valve. Oh, I understand what yeah, he yeah, means. Yeah, now. yeah, it, it is. is correct. Yeah. yeah. It is. Huh? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I get what you mean now. Yes, that's exactly. It's the notch on the Wiggler's diagram. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know. Uh, yes. Good. Good. Good catch. Good job. <laughs> All right, so do we all understand the Windkessel effect? <coughs> yes, great, moving on. So abnormal pulse pressures, right, are going to affect our compliance. So what is going to affect our pulse pressures? And we remember what pulse pressure is from Momo's lecture. So it's gonna be affected by things that are going to change either our arterial compliance, right? So changing their compliance, or the stroke volume, right? So the equation is going to be pulse pressure as stroke volume divided by arteriolar or arterial compliance. So normally this is our pulse pressure, right? Oops, I, I drew it wrong, but this is our pulse pressure, right? When we have reduced arterial compliance, we're going to have a way more increased pulse pressure because there's gonna be a huge difference between systole and diastole, right? Now, what can cause a reduce in arteri uh, arterial compliance, something called arterial scl arterial sclerosis. And basically what that is uh, in simple terms is kind of just the hardening of the vessel so that it's unable to comply to the blood that's coming in and the pressure that's affecting it, right? So it's gonna be a lot more stiff. The blood vessel is gonna be a lot more stiff and it's gonna reduce the compliance of that, thus causing a huge change in uh, arterial compliance, reducing it, right? Now, Another thing that can affect it and decrease pulse pressure a lot is going to be something called aortic valve stenosis. Now, I believe Yezan explained this in his lecture yesterday, but what that is, it's just the valve, the aortic valve is not going to be able to open and close as well as it normally does in a, a regular person, in a regular healthy person. Instead, it's gonna be a lot more stiff and hardened and it's not gonna be able to send out blood in the same way that it would normally, right? And if you have less blood being sent out, you're gonna have a reduced pulse pressure. Do we understand this? What? You can show them with the formula, like decrease, increase. Okay, so, yeah, no, no, yeah, we have here stroke volume and compliance. This. Okay, which, which part do you want me to repeat, the whole thing? So, okay, looking at this here, hold on. I wanna make yeah. sure I don't mess anything up because I'll confuse them more. Okay, the lower the number, the number. Okay, so here, yeah. let's look at the denominator, first of all. The lower the number in the denominator, the greater the pulse pressure is going to be, right? So looking at arterial sclerosis, for an example, we're going to have um, reduced compliance, right? The arteries are a lot stiffer than they should be, so they cannot be compliant at all to the vo volume that's coming in, which means that we're going to decrease the uh, compliance of the arteries, which means that the pulse pressure is going to be way more increased. And that's how you can see it on this graph here, right? 
The opposite is true for aortic valve stenosis. So aortic valve stenosis, like I said, is when the, heart, the aortic valve is hardened and it's not able to function in the way it normally does, which means that we're going to have a reduced stroke volume. Less blood is getting out of the heart and being sent into circulation. And if you're having this reduced stroke volume, you're going to, again, have a decreased, not increased, decreased. I'll, I'll actually clear this so that you guys can see it properly. I don't want to confuse you guys. So we said pulse pressure is equal to stroke volume over compliance with the RDA. So again, if we have the stroke volume decreased, it's going to decrease the pulse pressure, which you're seeing here. Is that clear? Yes, great. Yay. All right. Uh, moving on. So wedge pressure, right? What is wedge pressure? So for the right side of the heart, it's very easy for us to just insert a catheter into the vessels and put it straight into the white si right side of the heart and everything will be fine. That way we can see the pressure of the right side of the heart to check if everything's normal. But we cannot insert a catheter directly into the left side of the heart. The reason for that is because as Momo mentioned previously, the left side of the heart is under way higher pressure because again, it's pumping to the entire body, not just to the lungs, like the right side of the heart right? So it's dangerous for us to put a catheter right into the left side of the heart. So to combat this, we came up with a method called wedge pressure, which we can use to get an approximation of what the pressure is in the left atrium. So what do they do to calculate wedge pressure? It's essentially this. They're going to insert a catheter, right? Put it through the right atrium, and then we're going to go all the way up to the pulmonary artery, right? And then we're going to inflate a balloon. This is the tool that they're using. They inflate that balloon, right? And that balloon is basically gonna stop the flow of blood. And from that, they can calculate the pressure that would be in the left atrium had the blood kept flowing. Does that make sense? So you can see in the graph here, we have the pressure in the right atrium. And then in the right ventricle, again, the one in the right ventricle is way higher because it's pumping. And then the pulmonary artery, we have you know more pressure. And then this is where they insert right here. This is where they're inserting the catheter with the balloon. And then they blew up the balloon. And this is the pressure value that they got, right? And that normally is going to be 8 to 12. Yes, you stop the flow. Not for very long. Not for very long. Like for a very short amount of time, the patient is OK, yes. This is done under conditions where the patient is stable and will be like fine. Um, I don't think that they use this technique very often, but this is more of like a theoretical thing to understand. There is a way to calculate left atrial pressure, even, even if we can't insert something directly there. So a normal value for wedge pressure, again, is eight to, uh, eight to 12 millimeters per mercury. And this is the technique they use it for. To be honest, I'm not sure how they can ask you about this, but it's good to know just in case it does come up as an MCQ. And then here's a video, I watched it, it's pretty good. It's just an animation of how they take wedge pressure. So if you can't conceptualize it, if you can't conceptualize it, Watch this video and it'll help you understand more what's going on in the procedure side of things. But you won't most likely will not be any asked any questions from this video. So are we under do we understand what wedge pressure is? <laughs> Great. So moving on to the next question. Oh, okay. This is a practice question for you guys. So actually, this is an equation that came up earlier in Momo's lecture, and then I just talked about a little bit in regards to wedge pressure. So I want you guys to estimate the pulmonary vascular resistance uh, given these variables. This is, this is honestly among the more difficult questions you will get because there are a lot of variables here that you don't need. In like a minute, I'll start doing the question. Yeah, this is a, by the way, this is an equation that was brought up in Momo's lecture, and but this, but he, explained it. he explains it here. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, there's some, I know it's a hard question. I got it wrong when I did it for the first time. If you guys want me to just explain it, I can, but I'd like for you guys to try. I know they're working on it. They're working yeah. on it. They're good students. Mm 
Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna start writing the equation. So pulmonary vascular resistance is equal to mean pulmonary arterial pressure minus pulmonary wedge pressure divided by um, cardiac output. Okay, that's the equation that you use to calculate pulmonary vascular resistance. All right. And I guess the reason that this was brought up here is because they're using the wedge pressure. Is it two? It is two. Good job. Yay. Um, now, I'll calculate it. Wait, first of all, does everyone understand how we got to two? I'll do it. Uh, so here we have pulmonary vascular resistance. It's going to be mean pulmonary arterial pressure, which is here. We have 14. And we're going to subtract 14 from the pulmonary wedge pressure, which is here, four. And we're going to divide this by the cardiac output, which is five. So we're going to have 10 divided by five, which is equal to two, right? Honestly, I feel like among the mathematical questions, this is likely to be the most kind, most difficult. And the reason for that is because you're getting a lot of values that you just do not use whatsoever. So it's important for you guys to know the equations so that you know which numbers to plug in when. And so my suggestion for that, sorry. Oh, wait, first of all, does everyone get, does everyone understand how we got to two? Okay, good, great. So anyways, I was gonna say my suggestion for equations like this is stick as many as you can into your memory. And as soon as you sit down for the exam, you'll have that blank sheet of paper, write them all down. Write them all down uh, as you start the exam so that you have a reference to look at while you're doing the exam. It's gonna make things a lot less stressful and you're gonna be able to continuously check your equations. So moving on. I just wanted to say that this uh, this equation was it, like it goes back to the basic one, the one that was in the first lecture, which had resistance and um, flow with pressure. So flow is pressure difference over resistance, and it's the same thing. They just again they got cardiac output with the pressure of the pulmonary side. I know it's it's confusing, but as long as you know the equation, you'll be able to calculate this. So now this is the, I believe the last concept of this lecture is Starling forces. And honestly, one that I find a lot of students struggle with. Uh, I personally struggled with it a lot as well. So to be honest, I don't even wanna read all of this. I wanna draw for you guys, okay? Because that's the way to understand it. So there are four forces that determine the exchange of fluid in our capillaries. So first and foremost, startling forces are regarding the exchange of fluid in our capillaries. So here we have a capillary, right? So I said there are four forces, right? First force is going to be the capillary hydrostatic pressure, which is represented by PC, right? Capillary hydrostatic pressure is the pressure that is pushing fluid out of our capillaries. So this is pushing fluid out of our capillaries. The opposing force of this will be something called interstitial hydrostatic pressure. Interstitial just means everything that's not inside the capillaries. So the interstitial hydrostatic pressure, pressure like I said, is the opposite. So it's actually gonna be pushing fluid into the capillaries. So these forces are counteracting each other. The other two are going to be something called colloid osmotic pressure in the capillary. So what is that? That's actually referring to the proteins present in the capillaries. Now, we know normally through osmosis and when stuff like that, that proteins draw in fluid. All right. So this is actually going to bring fluid out from the interstitium into the capillary. And then our opposite or our opposing force for this is going to be the colloid osmotic pressure in the interstitial space, which is going to be drawing fluid out of the capillaries. So what are the things that are drawing fluid into the capillaries? That's gonna be our interstitial hydrostatic pressure and it's gonna be our capillary colloid osmotic pressure. These two, so this and this fluid in. Oops. <laughs> fluid in. This and this, which is our, uh, our interstitial or our hydrostatic pressure in the capillary and our colloid osmotic pressure in the interstitium are fluid out. Okay, so do we understand what these four forces is, are for Starling's forces? 
I want you guys to really understand the, okay, I got lost. That's fine. I really want you guys to understand the basis of Starling forces because there's a million ways they can ask questions about this. And it's a concept that if you don't get right, it can get confusing. So just for recap, we have four things that determine the forces or the movement of fluid between the capillaries or outside of the capillaries, okay? So we first are gonna talk about the forces that are pushing fluid out of the capillary. We said that this is the hydrostatic pressure in the capillary, right? Which is PC. And I'm gonna go and draw this again for you guys now. And the interstitial colloid osmotic pressure. These are what's pushing fluid out of the capillary or pulling fluid out of the capillary. Then we have two forces that are moving fluid into the capillary. This would be the interstitial hydrostatic pressure and the capillary colloid osmotic pressure, all right? <clears throat> so going back to draw this, right? This is our capillary. Okay, so first we're gonna talk about the forces moving fluid out of the capillary. There are two forces that move fluid out of the capillary. First force, the capillary hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure is pushing the fluid out of the capillary, all right? The second force that is taking fluid away from the capillary is the interstitial space colloid. Oops, no, I wrote C, it's not C, it's uh, I. <laughs> so this is drawing fluid away from the capillary. Now, what is colloid osmotic pressure? It's proteins. Proteins draw fluid. So this is the proteins in the interstitial space. It's drawing fluid out. The hydrostatic pressure is pushing fluid out, okay? Those are the forces. So again, PC and pi I are fluid out, okay? Now, what are the forces that draw fluid into the capillaries? Again, there are two and they each oppose each other. First, we have the hydrostatic pressure in the interstitial space. That's gonna push fluid in, okay? Then we have the hydrostatic or the colloid osmotic pressure in the capillary, which is gonna draw fluid in. Again, proteins are here. Proteins draw fluid. Fluid is gonna come from the interstitial space into the capillary. So what are our forces drawing fluid in? We have the interstitial space hydrostatic pressure and the colloid osmotic pressure in the capillary. This is fluid in. Do we understand that? Uh, so they're all the same, but two are inside and two are outside. Essentially, yeah. There's two, yeah, there's two forces outside. There's gonna be one protein force and one hydrostatic force inside the capillary. And the same is true for outside of the capillary. Do you get that? Okay, great. So it's important, sorry, I'm tying my shoe. It's important to mention that the interstitial pressures, right, are usually insignificant in a healthy person. So the interstitial colloid osmotic pressure and the interstitial hydrostatic pressure are not really going to be significant. What's more significant is what's present in the capillaries, all right? So, and we're gonna discuss that more, but do we understand the four forces for Starling forces? Because you, if you do not understand, tell me now, because we're gonna go over a lot of different concepts regarding this and you'll get lost if you don't get the basics of it. Okay, I'm moving on. So this is a, essentially a repeat of what I just said, right? Now we're adding the equation into it. What is the net driving pressure? The net driving pressure is the forces out, which we said are these, subtracted by the forces in. So these are the forces that are pushing fluid out of the capillary, which we said is the colloid osmotic pressure in the interstitial space. And we said is the hydrostatic pressure in the capillary. We're gonna subtract this by the forces that are drawing fluid into the capillary, which we said is the interstitial or the hydrostatic pressure in the interstitial space and the colloid osmotic pressure or the proteins in the capillary right? So when we subtract this, we're going to get a value. Honestly, what that number is doesn't really matter. What's more important is, is the number positive or is the number negative? Okay. If you get a positive number when subtracting these two things, you're going to have something called filtration. What is filtration? Filtration just means that fluid is moving from the capillary out into the interstitial space. That, mean the force, that means the forces drawing fluid out of the capillary are a lot stronger than the forces drawing fluid in. 
Now, the way I would remember this in first year is that I thought my Fs kind of look like a plus sign. Um, it's stupid, I know, but it's you know, whatever way you can remember it works. So this is the way I remember that positive indicates filtration. So do we understand why, like what filtration is in the positive and negative? Don't have the chat open. Okay, yeah. cool. So this opposite is true for reabsorption, right? So for reabsorption, you're gonna get a negative number. What? You're gonna get a negative number, which means that the forces drawing fluid in are way stronger than the forces drawing fluid out, which means that more liquid or more fluid is going to go into the capillaries. That's why you're getting a negative number. If you can remember that positive fil filtration by elimination, you can get that negative as reabsorption. All right? I'm gonna move on. Okay. So seeing what we just did, right? I want you guys to start applying this calculations to uh, our things. So this is the first one that I want you guys to apply. So can you tell me what the Starling force will be for here? And then I want you to also tell me, is it filtration or is it reabsorption? And if you guys would like me to write the equation, no, it's not 60. I'll, I'll rewrite the equation for you guys just so you remember. So the way we do it is the flu forces pushing fluid out. So we have PC plus um, the forces pushing fluid out, which would be the colloid osmotic pressure. Yes. Subtracted by what's left is the colloid osmotic pressure in the capillary. This is drawing fluid in and plus the, this, right? So again, that's what we have here, right? So again, a lot of you guys said 10. That's correct. We have positive 10, which is what? What's happening? Are we having filtration or reabsorption? Perfect. We're having filtration. So that's correct. You have filtration in the first one. Oops, I showed the answer for the next one. Um, the next, okay, you know what? To speed things up, the next one is zero. I think you guys understand how we get that. Now do the last one for me, which are these values. I want to erase the equation too. All right. Negative eight, right. So are we having, we're having what? Don't look. I'm blocking with my hand. You guys can still see. We're having reabsorption, great. So does everyone understand that how we got to these numbers? We all understand that, yeah? Okay, great. Again, it's very important that you guys get Starling forces. You understand the concept of them because there are a plethora of ways that can ask questions. They can ask questions about it. So if you understand it well, you'll be able to think your way through most of them. So here's something that happens naturally in our bodies, right? We're kind of constantly taking fluid out of our capillaries. We flew, we filter about 20 liters a day. I know it's, it's a, lot, a huge number, right? But we don't reabsorb all of that fluid, right? It stays in the interstitial space. We only reabsorb about 18 liters a day. So there's two liters left. Where do they go? The two liters left actually get, go into our lymphatic system. Now, I'm not going to open the subject of lymphatic system and what goes into that because you're going to guys are going to take that in your next block, HLS. But just know that we are not re reabsorbing everything that we filter in our capillaries. And we have a system in place in our body that takes up that extra fluid to make sure that we don't have all this fluid just kind of floating around in our interstitium. And I want to ask this. It might be a hard question. But if we have all this fluid in our interstitial space, what do you guys think will happen? Edema. Yes, perfect. Great. Yeah, there's going to be edema. So if we have all this excess fluid, right, in our interstitial space, which is the spaces outside of our capillaries, we're going to have something called edema, which is excessive fluid collection in the interstitial space. So it's going to cause, I think I have a picture of it here. Yeah, it's going to cause like something like this, right? It's going to cause the structures to become a lot bigger because there's so much fluid there, right? Now, do we all understand what edema is? Yes, 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 yes. Great, okay, I'm assuming that's a yes. Uh, now there are two types of edema, all right? There is exudate, would that be, 
would that be because none of it is being filtered? No, no, no. What's happening, I'll go back. What's happening is that the fluid is being filtered outside of the capillaries, right? It's going into this interstitial space here, right? But when we reabsorb it, we're not taking all the fluid that's in the interstitial space there. Some of it is still staying there, right? So we don't want fluid to stay in the interstitial space because it causes edema. So we have our lymphatic system, our lymph vessels, that will be another area where the fluid can go and circulate throughout the body. Does that make sense? <coughs> okay. So moving back to edema, there are two types of edema that you guys should know about. There is something called exudate, which is just edema containing proteins. Yeah. And then there is something called transudate. Transudate is just yeah. fluid without proteins, right? So exudate, oops, exudate has proteins in it, right? And that's usually because the membranes of the capillaries are damaged, which is going to allow for the bigger proteins to get through, right? The permeability of these capillaries is effective, is affected, which means more proteins are able to escape from the capillaries into the interstitial space. Transudate doesn't have proteins in it. It's just liquid, all right, without proteins. Transudate can just be due to increased, um, uh, can be due just to increase the increased like osmolality or not osmolality. What's the word? What's the word for transudate? Increased fluid. Leak no. No. Leakiness. Leakiness. That's a that's the easy way to say it. Leakiness of the capillaries. Do you guys get that? Okay. So here is just another picture explaining it. So we have transudate, which we said is without liquid. There's increased hydrostatic pressure or low oncotic pressure in the interstitial space. Plasma oncotic pressure, by the way, just means um, interstitial space. Okay. You don't need to know these. This is advanced for your level, but you're going to have fluid out in the interstitial space that's not going to have protein, right? Exudate is going to be due to something like inflammation or increased permeability of the capillaries. Again, you don't need to know these, but we're going to have fluid in the interstitial space that's going to be high in proteins. Do we get that? Yeah. So transudate is without proteins, exudate is with proteins. The way you can remember it is that exudate is like extra. So extra means they have extra proteins in the interstitial. I wrote that so bad. Extra, oh God, proteins. Do we understand that? All right, cool. So this is, I would say the most important part of my lecture right now is what are the causes of edema? You need to stick these four causes deep into your memory because they are going to ask questions about it. And we're gonna go through each one, one by one. But let's discuss them right now and then we'll discuss them again, each one, one by one. So first we have decreased arteriolar resistance. A decrease in the resistance of the arteriolar or arterioles is going to cause an increase in the hydrostatic pressure of the capillaries. Why is that? Because again, more fluid is flowing and it's going to the, uh, the capillaries, right? So we're gonna have increased hydrostatic pressure. You're gonna have more filtration. Remember, this is the force that is pushing fluid out, right? That's gonna lead to edema. Next is venous resistance. You have increased venous resistance. Same concept here. You're gonna have more hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries. Why is that? Is because if you're having increased venous resistance, that means it's going to be harder for the fluid to move from here all the way to here, which means it's spending more time in this area. And if it's spending more time in this area, that means, is there a question? No, there's not. How do I make this one? Yeah, wait. I got it. Yeah. So if there's spending more time in this area, there's going to be more um, hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries, which means that you're going to have more filtration, you're going to have more edema. Okay. If you have, wait, first of all, do you guys get those first two points? Okay. If you have decreased plasma proteins, you're going to have decreased colloid osmotic pressure in the capillary. You're going to have less proteins in the capillary. If there's decreased proteins. You're not going to have them in the capillary, which means that you're going to decrease the reabsorption. Again, you're going to have less of that force that's drawing the fluid into the capillary, right? So what can cause 
a decrease in plasma proteins? Does anyone know? A deficiency, yeah, but something like liver failure, which is, you know, our liver is responsible for creating a lot of these proteins. If we have liver failure, there's going to be a decrease in these plasma proteins. That means there's going to be less in our capillaries, which means that we're going to be drawing less fluid in. If we're drawing less fluid in, we're going to have less reabsorption. That's going to lead to edema. The last thing is the lymphatic system that I just brought up to you guys earlier. If we have decreased drainage from the lymphatic system, that means that fluid that's left over in the interstitial space is not going anywhere. And if it's not going anywhere, we're going to have edema, right? I think it's not important. Can you explain the venous again? All right. So if we have, well, let me finish this thought. I think it's not as important to know that this is increased uh, hydrostatic pressure in the interstitium. Um, but just think about it. There is more fluid in the interstitial space, which means that it's, it, it, it feels redundant right? It feels like, okay, interest this, it's going to be pushing fluid into the capillary. But you have to understand that there's more fluid in that area, which means that there's going to be edema there. And also the capillaries can only take so much, right? Remember that the reason that the capillaries or the fluid is going to the lymphatic system in the first place is because the capillaries can't reabsorb everything, okay? So back to the venous resistance. So if we have increased resistance in the veins, that means that the fluid is not flowing as much, right? The veins are not as, you know, they're resisting the movement of fluid. And if they're resisting the movement of fluid, we're going to have backup, right? And backup is going to be, what's the thing right next to the veins? Is the capillaries right here. So if we have backup into this capillary area, right? There's more time that the fluid is spending in this capillary, right? And if there's more time that the fluid is spending in this capillary, it has more time to be filtered. All right, and that's what they mean by increasing the hydrostatic pressure in the capillary. It has way more time to be filtered. That means more of it is going to be filtered. That means it's going to be edema. Do we understand these four points? We're going to go through them all again now. Can you repeat the lymph one? Okay, so... The lymph one I understand is confusing. So actually I'm gonna ask you to ignore this for right now and I'm gonna to come to it later. But just going back to this picture, all right, let me clear the drawings. Going back to this picture, the concept that we have here is that our capillaries are filtering a lot of fluid per day, right? And a lot of this is going into our interstitial space. So we have a bunch of fluid here, right? Our capillaries can only reabsorb so much of that. They can't take everything they filter back up. like. Picture it in terms of structures. Our capillaries are super small and the rest of our body is massive in comparison to it. So obviously our capillaries can't take up everything. So we're still gonna have fluid left over here even after our capillaries took up everything they could in reabsorption. We can't leave that fluid out anywhere. So we have our lymphatic system to take it up. However, if our lymphatic system is not functioning in the way that it should, that fluid has nowhere to go because our capillaries are already full with fluid, right? And there's no other place for this fluid to go which means that you're gonna have edema in this area, in the interstitial space. Do you understand that? Okay, great. So now let's go through it one by one. These are our clinical applications. So first and foremost, if you have something like right heart failure, <coughs> the blood is not going to pump as well as it should, right? If blood is not pumping, what's happening to it? It's backing up, it's backing up. If you're backing up the blood, right? then what's happening to it? The blood is going to be stuck in the capillaries. So here we have, I'll draw an image for you guys. So here we have blood backing up into our capillaries. We have more fluid here, right? If we're having more fluid in that area, that means we're going to increase the hydrostatic pressure of the capillary, which means that we're going to have more force pushing fluid out of the capillaries. Again, hydrostatic pressure is pushing fluid out of the capillary, right? If that's happening, we're gonna have increased filtration technically and re reduced reabsorption. Those two things just mean that fluid is getting out of the capillary and staying at the interstitial space, we're gonna have edema. Do we get it? I have a question. What do you mean by increased filtration? So filtration, what filtration means Filtration is the fluid that's inside the capillary moving outside of the capillary. So filtration 
means that the fluid that's originally here is going out into the space that's outside the capillary. Ah, oh, okay, okay, thank you. All right. Do we all understand why right heart failure can cause edema? I need, okay, great, yes. So the next one is literally the same exact thing. Left heart failure is gonna cause the same, actually nothing changed here besides the, what's happening. It's just left instead of right this time. Same concept all the way down. You're gonna have backup of the fluid. It's gonna increase the capillary hydrostatic pressure. It's gonna cause more filtration. You're gonna have pulmonary edema. Do we understand that? So can edema be a sign of heart failure? Yes, edema is a sign of heart failure. All right, next, and I kind of brought this up already, is liver disease, right? So our livers are responsible for producing a lot of the proteins that's present in the circulation of our body. So if we have a liver disease or a kidney disease, again, another structure in our body responsible for these proteins, we're going to have a, redu a reduction in the production of proteins, like I said six times already, right? If we're having a reduction in those proteins, we're going to have less of this force that's drawing things into or drawing fluid into the capillary. If we've got less of that force, less fluid is going into the capillary. So this time, it's not more filtration. It's actually less reabsorption. We're taking less fluid that's here up this way, right? And if we're taking less fluid that's here up into the capillaries, that means it's staying in this area. If it's staying in this area, you're getting edema. So do we understand why those can cause? Um, can you repeat again this one? Yeah. So our liver and our kidney are responsible for proteins, right? Our kidney is responsible for regulating the amount of protein and our liver is responsible for producing it, right? If there's an issue in either one of those structures, we're gonna have a mess up in the balance of proteins in our body, which means that we're gonna have less of the proteins in our capillary here. Those proteins in our capillary are responsible for drawing fluid inside the capillary. So if we don't have those proteins there, no fluid is going into the capillary. We're not reabsorbing any fluid into the capillary. If we're not reabsorbing any fluid in the capillary, that means it's staying in the interstitial space. And if it's staying in the interstitial space, it means you have re edema. Do you understand? Um, yes, thank you. Yes. All right, excellent, no problem. So next point is lymphatic ob ob obstruction. Oh my God. <coughs> so lymphatic obstruction. This is, I'm gonna to try to explain the part that gets confusing here. So we already understand that the capillaries are unable to reabsorb all the fluid that they filter, right? However, if there's an issue with our lymph, oh, if there's an issue with our lymphatic system, right? That fluid that's here is going to not go anywhere, right? It can go back in the capillary. But what tends to confuse a lot of students is that when we have an issue with our lymphatic system, we actually have an increase in the hydrostatic pressure in the interstitial space, right? What that means is that this pressure here is increased. So you're gonna say, Ibrahim, what, why, would, why, why would this cause edema if you're pushing more fluid into the capillary? The reason is the capillary cannot physically take any more fluid. So even though this value is increased, it doesn't matter because it's, it, the capillary can't take it. So this honestly means nothing. Okay, it's increased but we can't help it, right? So this is why it says here, there's more reabsorption, but it exceeds the capacity of the capillaries to actually reabsorb it. So this fluid stays in the interstitial space and it can't go anywhere. Therefore, edema. Do we get it? Yes, okay, great. So, these are two newer concepts. I would say prioritize understanding the first four before you understand these two, but these are pretty simple to understand. If we have inflammation, right? Inflammation is going to cause more permeability of our vessels to proteins. If we have more permeability of our vessels to proteins, we're gonna have an increase, right? So let me draw this out for you guys. We're having inflammation, right? More proteins are getting out of our capillary, okay? That means that this force is way stronger. And this force, if we remember, draws fluid out. So if this force is stronger and drawing fluid out because of the exiting of proteins from our capillary, we're gonna have more filtration. More fluid is going out of our capillary. That's gonna be edema. 
Now, in the case of inflammation, the edema is actually probably going to be localized just to the area where the inflammation is occurring. Do we get that? Could you repeat? Okay. So when we have inflammation, right, our capillaries sort of increase their permeability. The permeability, one of the processes of inflammation is, yeah, there's damage to the capillary. It's increased permeability to the proteins in the capillary, which means that the proteins in our capillary are escaping. They're coming out into this area. These are our proteins, okay? If there's more proteins here, what did we say in colloid osmotic pressure was? We said colloid osmotic pressure was the proteins drawing fluid. So if there's more proteins in this area, that means that this pressure is way stronger and it's drawing out more fluid. More fluid being drawn out means that all the fluid in the capillary is going out into the interstitial space, which means that we're gonna have more filtration. More fluid is going out, right? And then filtration, more fluid in the interstitial space means edema. Does that make sense? All right. So I think this is the last concept, dehydration. Now, if we are dehydrated, we're going to have a loss of fluid in the, in the capillaries, right? So, <clears throat> so, sorry, if we're dehydrated, we're going to have a loss of fluid in the pressure, uh, in the capillaries, right? This is actually not a cause of edema. This is instead a way that we can maintain blood pressure, right? In, in the case of dehydration, if we have less fluid in the capillaries, the proteins are going to be a lot more concentrated. There's not actually more proteins, but there's no fluid to dilute the protein. So there, it's more concentrated, which means that this value, which is drawing things in, is a lot more concentrated, which means that we're going to have a lot more fluid going from the interstitial space up into this area, right? That means we have more reabsorption and we're able to maintain our blood pressure a bit better in the case of dehydration. Now, this is not something you want, right? This is a, our body's mechanism to protect itself when we have dehydration to prevent from to prevent our blood pressure from falling crazily, right? Do we understand what's happening here? Do you get hypertensive when you're dehydrated? No, no. No, you get hypotensive. No, have, yeah. You get hypotensive. There's, There's less enough. volume. Yeah. Do you understand what, like, what this protective mechanism in our body is? This is the last concept, I believe. Yeah, this is our last concept. So we're all clear on this. So here's a practice question. Which of the following causes edema? So what's going to help you is drawing out the capillary and seeing each one. Not A. D is correct. Yeah, so D is correct. So again, let's draw our capillary and go through it again. So we have the interstitial or the hydrostatic pressure in the capillary, not interstitial, which is pushing fluid out. So we have a, if we have an increase in the interstitial hydrostatic pressure, right, which is this, we're pushing more fluid in. That's not going to cause edema. That's pushing more fluid in. Now, we have also this, which is drawing fluid in, and this, which is drawing fluid out. So if we have an increase in the capillary colloid osmotic pressure, again, we are drawing fluid in. That's not going to help. Hypotension is just not relevant to this question, honestly. Um, so that's a way that you can eliminate that question or that option. Next, Decrease in capillary colloid osmotic pressure. Let's find this in our capillary colloid osmotic pressure. Decrease in our capillary colloid osmotic pressure. Aha. So if we decrease this, right, that means fluid is not being drawn in, which means that fluid is going out. What happens if fluid goes out? Edema. Do we all understand why D is the answer? Yes, yes. Thank you. Awesome. So again, these are just the formulas from my lecture for you guys to look at as a table. And with that, our PAL session is concluded. Yay.
Um, I will stay around for like 10 minutes. Yes, we're gonna share the slides with you guys. We'll stay around for like 10 minutes to answer any questions. Um, but thank you so much, Shahid. You can stop the recording now.